And so here today, um, our, our text, I'm just going to read it. It says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If ye have persecuted me, I'm sorry, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours also. John 15, 20. And so, here today our message is on when bad things happen to good people. In summary of our lesson, only this is Jesus' fifth statement from the cross. And in this statement, he does refer to his physical suffering. In one word, he says to us, one, God can relate to our suffering. God can redeem our suffering. God can carry us through our suffering if we will let him. Uh, a man named Ray Pritchard um, said these words as a description of that day even though he wasn't there, this was a typical uh, Roman crucifixion, said this, it would be another hot day, you could tell it early in the morning. So at 9 a.m. it was already like 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Here and there the city merchants were stirring and rushing around and opening their stalls to make ready for another busy day. This was the beginning of Passover. Lots of things were going on. Lots of people were talking outside the city walls. They were getting ready for another round of crucifixion. This crucifixion was three individuals. One they called Jesus of Nazareth and two others, criminals. As the sun was beating down, they made ready the stakes, the hammers, the nails, and the ropes. At length, out came the crowd from the city, the two criminals and this man, Jesus, at nine. Crucifixion time. Hammers and nails, screams. Of course, we know that our Lord, the Bible says, he was, he was silent. And when he was reviled, the Bible says he opened not his mouth, but was as a lamb to the slaughter. And so when Jesus suffered, he, he took it, he, he wasn't screaming. I'm sure when these criminals they were screaming. <laughs> but um, Jesus, um, he was as a silent lamb to the slaughter. At 12, there was darkness, confusion, sounds of panic, people shouting, then silence. Oppressive silence upon the land for three hours. And it seemed like an eternity of darkness. Then suddenly the light shines there on the center of the cross. Jesus clearly about to die. Every breath a real effort. But he hears, the Roman soldiers hears Jesus say this one Greek word, dipso, meaning I thirst. Today I like to speak on that word uh, dipso or I thirst. When it comes to suffering, Jesus gives us three important lessons from the cross. First lesson, number one, is God can relate to our suffering. As a son of God, deity in flesh, Jesus knowing firsthand what it's like to suffer. We can't describe in detail the last 12 hours of his life because it just... It's just beyond imagination, really, what he suffered for us, the scourging. The ripping out of the beard, the ridiculing, the false charges, the nails through his hands and his feet, severely dehydrated from the blood, also loss of blood, the heat, the stress, and the effects that the Romans intended to slowly torture their victims. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. God knows what it's like to suffer. When you suffer, Please know that Jesus suffered before you. Jesus suffered more than you. Jesus suffered not only the physical challenges on the cross, but the spiritual. He took up the sins of all, all those that would believe upon him on the cross. He, he took the sins of the world. Well, what I'm trying to say is this. Not, not everybody is going to turn, repent, believe the gospel. Not everybody is going to believe what Jesus did. We know that because... There was one, uh, one of the thieves, I believe, uh, set, uh, made fun of Christ, and the others said, you know what, 
this man has, has done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve to be here. And the Bible says he repented. He asked the Lord to uh, forgive, to remember him. There's a story called the, uh, here the little article, Prince of Peace and the Pauper. It might be a poor example, but Mark Twain wrote a classic called The Prince and the Pauper. In this story, a 10-year-old Edward was a spoiled, bored prince, <laughs> and he found another pauper boy named um, Tom Conte, who was a precise double in appearance. The two traded places, but the prince, he wanted to get back to, into the castle, but he couldn't. And so the adventure begins. So this, throughout the story, this young prince, dirty and dressed in pauper's rags, insisted he is indeed heir to the throne, but nobody believes him because he is just dressed in rags. But in spite of this, he, he um, retains his princeliness, his, his bearings, <laughs> and he doesn't reprimand the people around him. He sees the suffering his, his father's cruel and selfish rule has brought, and he, instead he goes about caring for the people. But he never acts as the beggar, never treats anyone beneath his rank with disdain, and he finally ascends to the throne to, to his rightly place in the kingdom. And when he becomes king, he sets things right. He makes sure the poor are uh, taken care of. This might not be a good analogy, but we have the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, that came to us in a disguise, moved among us, witnessing the dregs of sin and caring for his subjects, all the while maintaining his royal bearing and never stop stooping to the destructive behavior of his fallen ones. Even when they hung him on the cross, even when they said, if you're, if you're the Messiah, come down from the cross, save yourself, save us, he rather said, Father, forgive them. Today we need the Lord Jesus. We need a high priest that is able uh, to move among his people, putting his wounded hand on our heads in blessing rather than cursing, lifting us up when we fall, interceding, for us before the Father, standing in the midst of his congregation, unchanged, as one that, that uh, he, he is like us, in, in, but in, in the part where he never sinned. He is not like us. He is perfect. Number two, secondly, Jesus' statement reminds us that God can redeem our suffering. You see, God can not only relate to your suffering, he can use it for his purposes if we allow him to. Consider Jesus on the cross earlier uh, in the lessons that we spoke on in the past weeks. In Psalms 22, David's psalm, concerning the piercing of the hands and the feet, the Bible says they also gambled for his clothes. In today's saying, he fulfills another verse from the Psalm 15, verse 15, 22 verse 15, which says, My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. He also fulfills Psalm 69, 21, which says, They gave me vinegar for my thirst. Everything that happened on the cross was for a reason. None of that pain was wasted. None of the things that Jesus went through was going to be um, wasted in, in vain. It did not catch God by surprise. He, 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 didn't, he didn't say, boy, we're having a bad day, uh, son, I didn't see this coming. No, it, it lined up perfectly with ancient prophecy. He knew that, um, that it was coming, that this suffering was coming. It was all part of God's plan to redeem us to himself. An innocent one had to pay for the sins of the guilty. John included an important clue in today's scripture. Also, he, he talk, um, John talks about the hyssop plant. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark mention a stalk that was used, uh, the hyssop plant, with vinegar to Jesus' mouth. I think I'm saying that right, but... 
But John chose a different word, a strange word, uh, the, the word hyssop. We know we see this word, the word hyssop in the Old Testament when before the children of Israel were led out of captivity in Egypt, they took a hyssop branch and dipped it in the blood of a sacrificial lamb and put it on the sides of their doorpost and overhead. And when that death angel came by that night at midnight, if they had the blood applied to the door, they were safe. And you know, even the Egyptians, not only the children of Israel in the land of Goshen, but the Egyptians had a, a chance to spare themselves if they would have applied the blood to their doors. But they chose not to. And that night, there was a great cry heard throughout all the land because the firstborn had perished. You know, God has provided himself a lamb that none would perish outside of him. God does want to redeem people, but people have to want to be redeemed. He can cause our suffering for good if we will let him. Will you bring your pain to God instead of asking why? Try asking what? Lord, what do you want to teach me from this pain that I've experienced? There is a true story that takes place in Disney's world in Cinderella's ca castle. It was packed with uh, kids and parents. Suddenly the children rushed to one side. If it had been a boat and not a castle, it would have capsized. Cinderella, the pristine princess with a... a a gorgeous young girl with her hair in place, flawless skin, and beaming smile stood waist deep in children, each wanting to see her, to touch her, and, and attention. The other side was cast down a va uh, uh, vacant. There was just one solitary little boy, seven or eight years old, with his brother holding his hand. Dwarfed in height, face deformed, he stood watching, quietly, wistfully, holding the hand again of his brother. You know what he wanted? He wanted to be with those children. He wanted to be in the middle, reaching for Cinderella, calling her name. But can't you feel his fear, his fear of being rejected? His fear of being taunted and teased and mocked again for the way he looked? Do you wish Cinderella would go over there and spend some time with him? Well, she did. She noticed that boy and carefully and politely went through the crowd until she was, she kneeled down, looked him in the eyes, and gave him a kiss on his face. And then she got up and walked away. When she walked away, she walked uh, <clears throat> She took her beauty with her. The boy was still deformed. He still had his issues. And this um, reminds me of Isaiah 53, 3-5, which maybe we'll use this as a Lord's Supper uh, verse sometime. But here it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So Jesus took our pain so we can have gain. Christ takes our infirmities. When I was in Bible college, they had a, uh, a place for everybody that was sick. They called it the infirmary. And I tried to stay away from that place, okay? <laughs> I think I might have went once in five years. <laughs> but uh, I got the flu shot, amen. <laughs> and, then I went, and then I got sick. But anyways, uh, he took our infirmities. Jesus gave more than a kiss, he gave his beauty. He paid more than a visit, he paid for our mistakes. He took more than a minute, he took away our sin. So the point is, healing is in Christ. 
You know, healing for the soul is in Christ. Uh, in this world, we're going to have physical infirmities, but the real healing, and, and there's some physical healing that happens at times, but the real healing is our soul. Our soul needs healing. Uh, yesterday, a neighbor came over and was talking to us, and she told my wife, thank you for praying for us. Our relationship is doing better. It's doing good now. That was a neighbor and uh, that had been suffering. Can I ask you today, is there somebody, somebody that um, the Lord has laid on your heart to be a spiritual blessing to, 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 to bring to Christ? Let me go into the third and last uh, point here is God can carry us through our suffering. When you have a bad day, have you ever felt sorry for yourself? You know, somebody said when it rains, it pours. <laughs> have you ever heard that? Somebody said when I, I heard, I've heard people say this, when I have a bad day, I really have a bad day. It's not just, a, you know, a few things go wrong, like everything goes wrong. And I'm sure in this world, in, in our lives, that we have ex different ha ones have experienced that. And uh, sometimes the question is asked, God, God, why do you allow your own children to suffer while the wicked prosper? The wicked are doing wonderful, it seems. Sometimes we wonder that. David in the Psalms, the Bible says he wondered that. Psychologists can call this, they call it the just world theory. That bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. Without knowing it, maybe even growing up, our parents would tell us, you know, uh, and rightly so, don't, don't cross that road or you can get hit by a car. And if you do, you'll get a spanking. But now, I guess you get a timeout, right? <laughs> But they would teach us the consequences of our behavior. If we're good, good things will happen. If we're bad, bad things were ha would ha will happen. Now, sometimes in life, we make improper choices and they can ruin relationships. We can waste money, although I guess when you're shopping, it's never a waste, amen. It's fun, amen. <laughs> okay. But we can waste money, we can hurt others with our actions, and the ones we love the most, we can say the meanest things to. We can bring things upon ourselves, we suffer at our own hands. But other times, we have done nothing wrong, we're like Job, we have done nothing to deserve suffering. We have put everything into a relationship and it still ends badly. We try to keep a healthy body, but we can still come down with cancer. We can put ourselves, pour ourselves into our work and still lose our job or lose what some would have, they call retirement. Jesus knows what it is to deal with things like this. Jesus is the most innocent human that ever lived. He never sinned. He died as a common criminal on the cross. He was unju unfairly judged by politicians. He was scorned by religious elite. He was turned on by the crowds, but God saw him through. And you know what? God can see us through. God can see you through. Uh, whatever, whatever is going on in your life at this time. As we read the crucifixion, we know the rest of the story. It must have been terrible for John, the beloved disciple, who was one of the closest disciples to Jesus at the foot of the cross, looking as his Savior, his Master, was dying a horrible death. But because of this horrible death, there was also a glorious resurrection shortly after. Because of a horrible Friday, what some would call a good Friday, but it wasn't too good of a Friday, if you know what I mean. Three days later, there was a glorious resurrection power of a wonderful resurrection that leads from death to life forever. Jesus said to his followers in John 15, 20, if they persecute me, they will persecute you. 
We can expect our own form of persecution when we follow Jesus. After all, ten of his disciples were tortured, killed for their faith. One was exiled. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that you can suffer not because you have done wrong, but because, and not because you're out of God's will, but you are exactly in the middle of God's will, and things still go awry. Never doubt God's love for you. God never gave up on his son Jesus. God has never, uh, and he, he, he never, um, the reason he didn't give up is because he saw the end. He knew what was in the end. The Bible says, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. And so they, they saw the end come. And there was a preacher called S.M. Lockridge. I listened to him on YouTube. A good old black preacher. And uh, he preached a sermon called, It's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. And I like that sermon. And uh, basically, it went through the crucifixion. And then uh, when Jesus rose from the grave, conquering death and the devil there was a poem written by an unknown uh, Confederate soldier, he was, who finally learned the lesson of the thorn or the troubles. He wrote these words, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. He, I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might fill the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might endure all things. I got nothing I asked for but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. In conclusion, it may look bleak in your relationships now, but God is not done yet. Your physical health may be poor, but God is not done yet. You may be lonely, depressed, broke, cut off from loved ones, but God is not done yet. Today may be Friday in your life, but please know that Sunday is coming. There is hope, and there is hope in Christ Jesus. You know, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Uh, we're just pilgrims on a journey. And one day we'll reach our heavenly home. But meanwhile, while we are here, the Lord has some things he wants to teach us. And sometimes the lessons, they feel so difficult. But God is here today to say, you know, I'm with you. I am your friend that wants to stick closer than a brother. At this time, let's pray, and then we will sing our closing hymn, a 280. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you did on the cross for us. And as we post this online or here, if there's one that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior and they've never committed their lives to you, I pray that um, today would be that day and they can talk to um, myself or Miss Witty or others that are here. Uh, just thank you for um, everything uh, that you are doing. I pray for this coming week, Lord, that you give us safety uh, each member here, everyone here, as well as those that aren't here. Just give us a wis your wisdom as the Maranatha Church Baptist Church goes forward for you. Just thank you for your love to us in your precious name. Amen. At this time, we can stand and... Uh...